Tonight on KQED Newsroom, a major Bay Area scientific breakthrough holds hope for a cleaner and safer planet. Simply put, this is one of the most impressive scientific feats of the 21st century. And we speak with Oakland Mayor Libby Schaff about her time in office and what she's accomplished. Plus, we take a look back at our eventful year as 2023 draws near. Coming to you from KQED headquarters in San Francisco this Friday, December 16th, 2022. Hello and welcome. This is KQED Newsroom and I'm Priya David Clemens. We are kicking off tonight with a nuclear technology breakthrough which could someday revolutionize energy systems around the globe. Although we have made strides towards a clean energy future, we still primarily rely on fossil fuels to power our cars and our homes and our infrastructure. On Tuesday, the U.S. Department of Energy announced that the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, right here in the Bay Area, made a major step towards eliminating the need for fossil fuels altogether. Last week at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in California, Scientists at the National Ignition Facility achieved fusion ignition. And that is creating more energy from fusion reactions than the energy used to start the process. It's the first time it has ever been done in a laboratory, anywhere in the world. San Jose Mercury News science and research reporter Lisa Krieger joins us via Skype from Lake Tahoe, where she's on assignment. Lisa, thanks for popping in for us to help us understand what this is all about. So why, Thank you is, for the this, invitation. why is this breakthrough so important? It's the first step to what could be a really clean and safe approach to creating more energy, which we desperately need. Um, you're not extracting natural gas, you're not uh, digging up coal, you're not releasing carbon into the atmosphere. And what it was was proof of concept uh, that it could be done, that we could use fusion as a way to generate more um, energy and to create more sustainability. The specific scientific term we're hearing here is ignition, and that definitely sparks the imagination, but I'm not sure I know exactly what that is. Can you explain it? Yeah, so ignition is the process of infusion where you actually generate more power than, than you consume. And that's what we need for sustainable technology moving forward. We're really familiar with fission, which is when atoms explode. This is atoms when atoms fuse um, and in the process generate huge amount of energy. It's really exciting for us here in the Bay Area. I mean, this is our own lab just east of the town of Livermore, right off 580, two miles off 580 has been working for 60 years, like multiple generations of scientists, thousands of scientists are working on this and they finally succeeded. For just one split, split second, they achieved ignition for the first time in history. And they did it using laser beams. I mean, talk about far out there scientific technology, right? We think from the future. Yeah. That's what made this such a success is that we are the world capital for these laser beams. There's a joke that Lawrence Livermore National Labs means Lasers, lasers, nothing but lasers. So it was the power of these lasers. So what they do is they ignite two little atoms, or, you know, throw energy in two little atoms um, of hydrogen and it fuses. And in the process of fusing, emits huge amount of energy. And this time, for the first time in history, it emitted more than it consumed. And it's just proof of concept, right? It's proof of concept. But it's, it's the scientific and engineering breakthrough that we've been working towards and really waiting for. So now it just needs to be replicated, needs to be scaled up, needs to be commercialized. Now there was a very small amount of energy created in this experiment. What needs to happen before this is a solution that we could actually use at a large scale? Yeah, you know, orders of magnitude uh, scaling up. There's several things that need to happen. One is we just need to get better at it. Um, this was just one experiment, one, one time. It has to be re replicated like thousands of times per second continuously on a commercial scale in a way that's affordable um, to really um, achieve what, what is promise. Uh, so we do have a long way to go and, and happy to elaborate, but there's some major challenges. 
Well, I do have a question about timeline. Scientists have been working on this problem for 60 years. Are we talking about, you know, another 60 years before it becomes something that we see in our daily lives? That was the first question that came up in, the, in Tuesday's press conference. And they are saying decades. Um, they're saying not six decades, fewer decades, but that it will take that long to, to scale up, build it out, make it commercial. And it's a competitive landscape, you know, happily, um, for alternative energy sources. We've got solar, we've got, we've got wind, um, and, it, and, it, and it has to be affordable, so. Mm. I think another question that many have is whether or not this is safe. You know, we hear about nuclear technology and nuclear energies that can be used to power our homes, but we also understand that nuclear technologies can unleash a tremendous amount of devastation. Right. So, so unlike fission, which uses radioactivity and, and uranium, um, we don't have that as a byproduct um, with fusion. Um, fission, as I mentioned, exploding of atoms, uh, uranium creates a lot of waste that you have to figure out what to do with. This isn't the case. This is fusing of two of hydrogen atoms, and actually helium is the is the byproduct, um, which is very safe. So there's a lot of optimism about its safety moving forward. You briefly mentioned that it's a competitive landscape. It's true, we are working on moving towards more wind, solar, and hydroelectric power. It sounds like we should definitely continue to invest in those alternative energy sources. Absolutely, and you know, time's a ticking, right? We're, the whole goal of the Paris um, 2015 agreement was to not increase global temperature by more than 1.5 degrees centigrade um, over time. There's a timeline. Um, we don't have time you know, another 40 or 50 years to work on this and get it right. We really need to, to stop global warming as soon as possible. And I think, you know, the only way to really move that forward is to get off carbon. And um, that's why wind and solar continues to be very important. A lot of uh, critics um, of fusion are saying if we invested as much in these alternative technologies, we'd see a lot of progress there. Um, and that we really do need to keep our eyes on that as well. All right, well, thank you so much. Before I let you go, this is a different topic, but since you're up there in Lake Tahoe, how is the snow? How is the energy <laughs> up there? What are you seeing? It's a lot of buzz. Um, pretty, people are pretty stoked to use a ski expression. We've had uh, 9.5 feet since December 1st, and conditions are pretty lovely. Um, so not a whole lot in the near-term forecast, unfortunately, through the holidays, but. You know, the resorts are doing really well of maintaining what we have. There's a lot. There's good coverage. All right. Lisa Krieger with the Mercury News. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Libby Schaff is capping off eight years as mayor of the city of Oakland. Schaff was born in Oakland, and she first entered the city's political scene in 1999 as an aide in City Hall. She's focused much of her time in office on creating better housing and educational opportunities for Oaklanders. Libby Schaff joins us now. Mayor Schaff, thanks for being here in studio. Thank you. So what was it eight years ago that propelled you to run for mayor? You know, I felt like Oakland was at this crossroads, um, that often opportunity had left it behind, but there was this feeling that it might be Oakland's time to become revitalized, mm -hmm. but I did not want that revitalization to push out long-term or vulnerable Oaklanders. I wanted that Oakland secret sauce to be preserved, um, the culture, the history and legacy of social activism. And so I felt like as someone who was experienced with government, I could take advantage of the moment, but as a true Oaklander, I was never gonna sell Oakland soul. Well, do you think that you managed to do the thing you wanted to do while you were in office? Did you revitalize Oakland while keeping that special sauce? Well, you know, the powers of gentrification are strong, but I did everything I could to be true to those values. Uh, and certainly the pandemic gave us all, you know, a turn, a, a shock. But at the beginning of 2020, it really did feel like Oakland was on the rise, like mm. the vitality, the art scene, the food scene, the fact that we had built tw nearly 20,000 new homes to stop the displacement, to prevent uh, evictions. We strengthened tenant protections for 36,000 low-income Oaklanders slept better at night because of the policies and programs we put in place. Uh, and I, I'm not saying that that was enough 
to stop all displacement, to stop the incredible rise in the cost of living. But I believe we did everything we could to stabilize families, to keep Oaklanders in Oakland, to keep Oakland, Oakland, while still seeing this revitalization. Another thing that had happened at that point just before the pandemic was that gun violence was at a low compared to where it had been in years past and certainly compared to where it is now. Tell us about that moment in time. You know, that moment felt incredible. It was Oakland's most sustained period of peace in its history. You know, our records go back to 1985. And to this day, that is still the lowest five-year average of murders and shootings that Oakland has ever had. But the pandemic, like it did for all cities across the nation, saw a huge spike in gun violence. And it's heartbreaking because we've cut it in half. And then the pandemic changed all that. Now, we are seeing some promising trends, particularly in the last three months, uh, as we are able to reinstate the ceasefire strategies that we were using. We're trying also some other very creative health and prevention-based strategies. Uh, and we're also trying to recover the staffing shortage that our police department suffered from. You know, following the defund movement, we saw just a wave of attrition and it really brought staffing to a dangerously low place. Um, but I'm seeing that all get better and I'm very hopeful for the future that Oakland will regain that sense of peace. You've said in the past that there needs to be new federal regulations to really curb the problems of gun violence. Would you say that as the city that you're sort of doomed to this cycle of violence unless there's action at the federal level? I'm never going to say that. I mean, I believe that we have the power within ourselves to make the right choices. We know that there is so much trauma in our society uh, that comes from systemic racism, intergenerational poverty. I do think, and I, I was just with the Dalai Lama, mm -hmm. he actually brought this up, that access to weapons exacerbates all of this. Uh, we, we don't see any other country in the world that has this level of guns and gun violence. The Oakland Police Department has been riddled with trouble for a long time. I'm curious if you feel like, listen, Oakland Police Department is now on the footing you want it to be on, will be out of oversight soon, and a future lies ahead that is brighter, more trustworthy, safer for residents. Priya, a milestone I am most proud of is that the Oakland Police Department this year was, for the first time, found in compliance with the negotiated settlement agreement. It was found to have achieved the reforms that it promised nearly 20 years ago. We are in the one year sustainability period. Okay. So the court found the Oakland Police Department in compliance with all of the court ordered reforms. And now it is in this one year period of watching to make sure that they have confidence that those reforms will be sustained forever without their supervision. So let's turn to education. You have managed to raise a lot of money, $50 million, to go towards supporting education in Oakland. Tell us about the work that you've done in education, what you're most proud of, and where you're seeing it being the most effective. Well, I am most proud of creating the Oakland Promise, um, what is nationally recognized as the most comprehensive cradle-to-career initiative of its kind. And literally, it's starting with babies born to low-income parents that get a $500 college savings account at birth and parents are offered financial coaching and child development support. And it follows those children and families not just to their getting into college, but actually finishing college. And that could be a four-year degree, a two-year degree, or a trade certificate. We actually support all of those with mentors, with scholarships, with access coaching all the way along, and even building a college-going culture as early as elementary school. We give every kindergartner in Oakland a $100 early college scholarship in kindergarten. It is the cutest thing you could ever see. But to change that mindset, yep. to let people know you should be thinking about this from the That's beginning right. on. This is possible for you. That's right. I want every child in Oakland to know that their opportunities are boundless, that they are brilliant. And I want every parent to never fear 
that they can send their child to college. You recently gave your very last State of the City address, and you talked about three issues that Oakland is facing in 2022, crime, housing, and homelessness. When it comes to homelessness, can you tell us where the city is now compared to where you were eight years ago when you took office? We um, were looking at the last point in time count that compared this point in time, January of 2022, with three years prior. And what we have seen is that encampment or outdoor homelessness actually decreased in these last three years by 16%. But we've seen a huge increase in vehicular homelessness, people living in RVs or even their cars. And we were proud to see an increase in the number of unsheltered people that we were able to get indoors into shelter and services. That actually doubled over these last three years. And over the last five years, we have quadrupled our shelter capacity. What still needs to be done? So much. This housing crisis is not just unique to Oakland or even the Bay Area. It's particularly profound in California where people have been coming here to take high paying jobs and the cost of housing has gone up as we have not built enough housing and definitely not enough affordable housing. The dismantling of our mental health system, the fact that prison has now become the largest mental health treatment center. Uh, how inhumane is that? Not to mention inefficient as government. So we have to wrap our arms around the mental health system and we've got to create an adequate supply of affordable housing. The solution to homelessness is housing. The Oakland A's leadership has been saying that they might stay in Oakland, they might go to Las Vegas. You have been passionately working on keeping them in Oakland for a long time, selling them on a vision that you have for them. How hopeful are you that they're going to stay? Very hopeful. Um, and I'm hopeful not just for the A's, not just because we want to keep, you know, this last sports team, major league sports team. Like when I became the mayor, all of our sports teams had decided to leave Oakland. And this is the one that I have worked so hard to see this vision of not just a new ballpark, which they will privately finance. Let's make that very clear. But what's exciting, it's a whole new neighborhood with beautiful public parks on the waterfront good union jobs, affordable housing, and yes, an iconic ballpark. I mean, that design is spectacular. So it has been so exciting to finally get them to see that vision, to lean in, and I believe it will absolutely get done because they have worked so hard towards this vision. I know they keep saying Las Vegas parallel paths. I love texting them the weather report from Las Vegas. <laughs> oh, it's a lovely 108 degrees today. Um, and we are also bringing in the grant money to make all the improvements outside of the project area, but necessary to make the project successful, to improve connectivity to our waterfront, and also to better safeguard those port operations, which also are so important to the city. But the people deserve their waterfront, and having a ballpark and a whole new neighborhood on um, Howard Terminal is gonna give people back their waterfront. It is going to be spectacular. I totally believe it's going to happen this next year. And let's be clear, if the A's aren't smart enough to take advantage of this beautiful opportunity, someone else will. You promoted Oakland as the most unapologetic sanctuary city in the world. What did you mean by that? And tell us about that moment in which you grabbed the national spotlight by standing up to former President Donald Trump. Well. 2016 was a really difficult year for me as mayor. We had the police scandal. Uh, we had the very tragic ghost ship fire. But to see Donald Trump get elected as president uh, just felt like a slap in the face of Oakland values. Every Oaklander is proud that our city represents inclusive diversity. And he did everything he could to come after cities like ours. I did come to learn about a large scale federal enforcement action against undocumented residents. And it was a moral dilemma. And I'll be honest with you, I was consulting with the 
immigrant services community and there was a big split there were strong opinions on both sides about whether i should issue a public warning or not but at the end of the day i felt like it was the right thing to do and i have never regretted it mm -hmm. i never anticipated that it would get the level of national attention it got and part of that was from trump himself you know he went on national tv and said jeff sessions why isn't the mayor of oakland in jail he led crowds to chant, lock Libby up. It, it was a little surreal there <laughs> for mm -hmm. a, a minute. But what I felt was like, this is the moment to be Oakland. Oaklanders are tough. They are clear about their values. They are unapologetic. And I felt like I was speaking for the community about how angry everyone was in that moment where we had the highest official in our land preaching hate. This next year is going to be a tough one financially from all predictions, not just for Oakland, but for California at large. The city is going to be looking at potentially a very large budget shortfall. What sort of problems could Oakland face in the next year and the years to come because of this? Two things people should watch for. Police staffing. That has always been a big fight in Oakland. Oakland has always had the lowest officer per crime staffing of any city in America. Hmm. And so to make sure that it does not fall any lower is very important. The second concern I have is four years ago, um, I've been part of the big city mayors of California. In fact, I'm their first woman chair, first Oakland mayor chair. Uh, but we were able to get direct funding from the state to cities for homelessness. Usually funding goes to the counties, uh, it's, it still does, but the cities also got funding for the first time. If that funding goes away, that will be devastating for our homeless uh, efforts. What was the hardest moment for you as mayor in these last eight years? Oh, no question, the ghost ship fire. Just the level of loss, the death, the grieving, the anger at government around an issue that I care very much about, and that is preserving uh, affordable space for artists to live and work in. That is the heart and soul of Oakland. And to be the person that had to talk to the family, the friends, to face the media, and it was you know, the national story for days upon days, and to be at the operational site where our firefighters were pulling bodies out of the rubble. I remember one firefighter said to me, everybody I took out last night had the face of my daughter. Mm. Being responsible for death and holding the trauma of a city like Oakland is the hardest part of being mayor. Have there been regulations that have changed because of what happened with the ghost ship fire? Absolutely. And one thing that we did that was hard but important was to not overreact, to not go down and shut down artists' housing everywhere, but rather to thread that needle and demand that we can have safety and affordability and artist housing at the same time and that there was a way to do all of that better. And that is what we did. That's how we moved forward. I'm happy to say this year, we have 100% of all mandated fire inspections completed and whole new systems of how we actually inspect, prevent, and ensure fire safety. What is next for you? <laughs> well, um, I will decide next year. I really committed to being the mayor of Oakland to the last second, which is 10.59 a.m. on January 2nd. Um, and I will decide what's next for me next year. I promise I will spend the rest of my life in public service. And I'm looking forward to getting to spend a little bit more time with my family, my kids. They're still in high school. Um, and just, you know, to get a good night's sleep. <laughs> I have to say, I'm hearing a possible run for future office. So we're looking forward to see what comes next for you. Mayor Libby Schaff, thank you. Thank you, Priya. And finally tonight, something a bit different to close out the year. We take a look at a collection of photos from KQED photographers as they chronicled moments of struggle and hope in the Bay Area.
This week's Something Beautiful is 2022, a year in photos. A special thank you to Beth LaVerge and her KQED photography team for those beautiful images. We are off for the next two weeks and we wish you all happy holidays. We also want to recognize that while this is the best time of the year for some, it can also be very hard if you're coping with grief or depression or mental illness. If you're struggling, please reach out to a crisis hotline. All you need to do is call 988. Take care of yourselves, have a great holiday season, and we will see you right back here on January 6th, 2023, for an interview with the outgoing mayor of San Jose, Sam Licardo. If you'd like to connect with us, you can email us at knr at kqed.org. You can also find KQED Newsroom online or on Twitter, and you can reach me on social media at Priya D. Clemens. Thank you, as always, for joining us. See you next year.